Hey everyone, and welcome to the Music Production Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Funk. And today on our show, we have Ishan Kataru, also known as Push for Life. Ishan has actually been on the show before, episode number 51, and we pick up on our conversation and talk about a lot of cool things in this episode. Um, I don't think you need to hear the first one to enjoy this one, but I think hearing them both does kind of add to the whole story. Um, Ishan has just recently released a really interesting course called Getting to Know and Love Chromatic Mode, and this is for Ableton Push 2. It's a pretty cool concept. In the tutorials, you learn how to play box prelude number one in C major on push. And in the process, you also learn about chromatic mode and going outside the scales and lots of cool stuff that we'll talk about in the show. But Eshan has kindly offered listeners of this podcast the first few tutorials of the course for free. So if you head over to pushforlife.eu slash afrodjmac, you can check this out for free and get a taste of what the course is all about. Today, I have Sean Kataru, who is Push for Life, as you may know him <laughs> on the internet. Uh, what's up, man? Good to talk to you again. Hey, great to talk to you, too. I'm really happy to be back on the podcast. Yeah, reunited. It's nice. Yeah. <laughs> nice to see you. It's, it's been a little while, I think around a year or so. I know yeah. time flies. It's crazy. Yeah, it really does. I think I think when 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 I did it last, you'd only had like maybe twenty, thirty episodes out. Yeah, Is maybe. Right? Yeah, I remember right. you sort of still being. I think maybe you'd been doing it for four or five months. So. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I forget the exact number we were on, but yeah, it's, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's been a so few. So what, what what number are you at now? I believe this is gonna be one oh three. Excellent. So you had your anniversary yeah. recently. Yeah, and uh, it'll be a year, you know, early March. It'll be um, one year of this. Really? I, th I think I started right in the beginning of March um, 2017. So Excellent. Who did, was uh, Houston episode 100 or who was, who was on 100? No, uh, 100 was just me. <laughs> oh, just you. You know, maybe you can kind of relate to this because um, I know you've worked on so many huge projects um as like episode 100 is approaching i'm starting to stress out a little bit like i need fireworks yeah. i need like dancers i need you know yeah, laser yeah, lights yeah. and everything so it started to swell into this huge thing where I, it almost paralyzed me like i don't even know what to do now nothing will ever be good enough so i just I'm sure went back to the basics kind of like the way i started the show and just talked and just thought about like why I'm here, how I made it to 100 and how I'll get to 200 and just um, it wound up being I think like 20 minutes or so but it was kind of nice to just reflect on it and and think about the things that you know led to this point and to remember to refocus to keep going. Yeah. So. Well, Hats off to you, man. It's uh, getting to 100 episodes. I think I got to about 12 episodes, and I was like, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> you know what I mean? But that's that's amazing. Yeah, your, your podcast, I really did enjoy it quite a bit. Uh, music, Sounds, and Silence, for those that yeah. want to check it out. You, you, yeah, you had, like, um, I think right about then, 12, 13 episodes, and um, you, they were great. Um, really enjoyed it. I actually, I, actually, I actually still have uh, one final episode that I – you know, still have to put out that's recorded. It's just not edited with um, um, Brian Mantia, also known as uh, Brain, the drummer Brain. I don't know if okay. you've ever heard of him. He, he played with Primus and uh, oh, nice uh, Guns and Roses and mm. uh, a, a whole bunch of people. Right. But I was a, a, Small a huge bands. fan of his. <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> when he when he did uh, Primus, he he did an album especially that I liked uh, called Anti Pop, mm -hmm. and um, was a because I'm a, a drummer for those that that don't know that but um yeah i was a huge fan of his so to get to talk to him as almost like my penultimate episode was amazing but it was i think it was at least an hour and a half of talking and because i heavily edit my episodes uh, i literally just haven't had the time since we recorded it to sit down for a couple of weeks and just concentrate on it but yeah. i still have it so i'm sure at some point i will get around to editing it sorry about that brian if you're listening <laughs> <laughs> well yeah that was something i i yeah, I mentioned to you, I remember watching like a, a uh, I guess time lapse is the right word, time yeah. lapse video of you editing your podcast. And it's, you know, it's like you and fast forward doing all the all the moves. And yeah. I, like I'm the exact opposite. 
uh, pretty much what you hear is what you get. What yeah. this is what happened, everyone. <laughs> I, mean, I think that's actually the the secret to longevity if you're doing everything on your own. Because once you get into editing and uh, it's just so time consuming, consuming. And if yeah. you don't have like an assistant at least who can sort of do the the dirty work for you, so to speak, it's just there's just too much to do, you know. So I think you you've decided to go the the right direction. <laughs> I think this has been one of my little secrets <laughs> to a lot of the work I do is uh, to sort of find the virtue in the manageable path. Like, yeah. um, you know, like I just know I would never do it if I had to spend all that time editing and doing, you know, I, th I think I might have mentioned this in episode one where um, I had this big idea, this grand vision for the podcast and a lot of fun ideas it could be, but I'd never started it because it was too much. Yeah, so just the thought of it's so overwhelming, right? Yeah, so one, you know, I was going to stream it live. I was going to have like all these sections and um, segments, which... Jingles you know, in between. <laughs> yeah, like I might still one day get there, but um, I just decided, you know what? Uh, I'm going to just do it. And I didn't even have like an opening song or intro. I yeah. said, and eventually I, I actually, got to be honest with you, like, because I listen to a lot of podcasts and... Uh, I like the ones that are just like direct, you know what I mean? Like, I mean, even though mine was heavily edited and with music and all that kind of thing, when I listen to a podcast, uh, I really enjoy it because it literally sounds like the person is just talking to you, you know yeah. what I mean? And um, I guess what I was trying to do was more like a uh, like an audio documentary or something. It wasn't mm -hmm. really so much a, a podcast like a standard podcast, but I think as a, in terms of listening, uh, if you're a fan of someone and they're just like unedited, just speaking to you, it's it's really, it's very human. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, and yeah. that's exactly what I embraced in order to to justify the manageable route. It's like yeah. it's gonna be real. It's gonna be natural. And I'm I'm like you too. A lot of the podcasts I enjoy are just kind of unscripted, open conversation. But I do love. You know, some things like Song Exploder is, is an amazing podcast oh, yeah. that obviously cool. takes a long time. Yours, you, the editing you did was excellent and, and valuable to the experience. Oh, thanks. I, I just know, like, I wouldn't be sitting here doing yeah. this. <laughs> I mean, there's, so. just, there's just too many other things to do, I think. Yeah. You know, like, uh, you know, people like yourself and myself, you know, we, we make tutorials, we make courses, we have, you know different audiences all over the social media and i mean to think about you know what what one has to do these days just in order to kind of stay afloat that you know people will find what you do with all the algorithms and stuff mm -hmm. it's 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 overwhelming enough as it is just trying to you know keep up with yeah you know the pressure at the end of the day and uh, so like you said it's kind of like I guess what what you've embraced is you know the notion of the minimum viable product. You know what I mean? What's the minimum I have to do to get this out there into the world so it's you know so it can actually exist. You know what I mean? Instead of having all of these lofty ideas of what it could be and it never seeing the light of day. You know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah, I, I agree. The minimal uh, effective dose type of thing. Yeah. Where you'll get just enough. Um, and and now it's easier for me to add things too. Like there have been episodes where I've had music and we've kind of listened to people's tracks and talked about them. And and since I've already kind of figured out how to do the other stuff, that's not super hard to integrate. Yeah, but, and I'm and I'm sure you're so routine now in just the sort of everyday kind of, you know, like uh, inviting people and you know the logistics of setting up a podcast even yeah. is is work that people don't really I think uh, realize that the what goes on behind the scenes and you know with you doing so many podcasts just trying to probably get everyone you know getting the meeting time set up and um, you know just the emails back and forth I mean that's time consumed as well you know yeah and even just like emotionally like getting the courage to send that email or to reach out to someone yeah <laughs> is one thing and if someone and if someone doesn't answer back you're like oh man yeah <laughs> yeah i mean there's there's always a percentage that you never hear from or you never get around to or never yeah. work out and um you know that's, i was actually surprised <laughs> though when when i was doing my podcast how many people did answer and were absolutely uh, you know Me available too. to do it it's yeah. like wow 
you know, I'm glad I started this just so I can talk to this person. You know what I mean? Yeah, there's been a lot of times where I go to my wife and I'm like, I can't believe this person wants to talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> Do they really know who I am? I'm just some guy on the internet. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Yeah. But you know, it's it's a, it's a cool thing, and um, yeah, I'm I'm I really got a lot of value out of what you did, and um, if there's one more episode coming. That's great. If you ever decide to do a season two, that's cool too. And yeah, uh, I th I think if I ever have the luxury of having an assistant, you know, even if it's like online, just someone who helps edit or something. Yeah, I, I I'd love to do it again because I actually really enjoyed it because it, you know, putting it together uh, because it was more like I guess you could say like a philosophical kind of uh, podcast where I, you know I think about the, the meaning of music and that kind of thing and you know speaking to people about it um, I I actually got so much out of it just uh, reflecting on what people would say and because you know music such a subjective uh, experience everyone has a different opinion on what it is and how it affects them and what they like about it so every even though the the topic was always exactly the same every conversation mm -hmm. was so unique and and i would always come away thinking about music differently so um i'd even love to do it just for myself again you know so hopefully yeah. at some point i'll have the time yeah i think i i get the most out of it out of anyone personally <laughs> which is cool so um let's see um maybe we should just do a quick uh hello who are you type of thing just in case um now you have been on All the right. show in the past, so if there are any yeah. uh, diehard <laughs> listeners, you may know that we have had a, a talk before, and um, it was a great talk. Um, just like you said, like you you do bring a lot of that philosophical aspect to um, you know your thinking about music and and what you've done and where you're going with stuff. Episode fifty one, by the way, if you're interested, oh, wow. everybody. Yeah, the halfway point. So. Uh, cool. Yeah, you mind telling us about yourself? A little, yeah, little sure. the basics I mean, rundown. I'll try and keep it short. I guess I've I've reached uh, my ripe old age already, so I've I've got a, a lot of stuff under my belt. But I guess generally, um, you know, I started off as a, a session drummer. That was kind of like my uh, my living that I pursued for uh, about fifteen years. Um, I started off. Uh, primarily in London and I moved to Los Angeles for a while and then I, I based myself in Germany but would sort of like travel all over the world. I mm. uh, did that for about 15 years, worked with uh, uh, the major acts that I worked with were uh, Imogen Heap, Blue Man Group, Cirque du Soleil. Um, yeah, they're the, the ones that most people know. And uh, yeah, then I guess, uh, let me see. In 2010, I, I got really sick, so um, I had to stop the whole session drumming thing. And um, it took me, a, you know, a few years to kind of recover from that. Uh, I needed a, a kidney transplant and that kind of thing. And I guess I think it was um, in December of 2015. So just over three years ago, I discovered. Uh, well, I knew about the push, but I bought myself a push. And I just completely fell in love with it. With it, it was like, um, I guess that the instrument that I'd always wanted, mm -hmm. but it never existed up until that point. If you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, because I'd started off on piano, I had a bit of a you know harmonic uh, background, but um, you know I only had basic keyboard skills, and you know the push, especially with the in key mode for people who know what push can do. That was like really enlightening to me because I could just, you know, select something like C minor and then all I would have is C minor and uh you know there's nothing really you could wrong that you could play when you're in in key mode. You know what yeah. I mean? So I could just experiment and um you know fairly quickly I realized that it was all about shapes and um patterns that you could sort of do and then you could just sort of maybe uh, you know, move horizontally up or down or to the left or to the right. And all of a sudden you'd have a different pattern. And, you know, in in, in key mode, you'd also have a, a different chord. So you might be in a major chord at one point and then in a minor chord, you know, and another point depending on where you're playing the, the specific shapes. So, um, yeah, and because I was really into finger drumming, it, it all kind of made complete sense to me. 
and I know a lot of people, you know, if, especially if you're a keyboardist, um, I've heard a lot of people having, you know, difficulties getting into the push. But uh, for me, it was just like, I don't know why it just sort of clicked in my brain. And from yeah. that moment onwards, I almost like sort of jumped ship and push has become sort of my main focus since then. I, I still drum. I teach drums. Uh, but, you know, it, when I sit down to make music, I'm, I'm just on my push. Mm -hmm. I'll only ever use drumsticks if I want to record something very, very specific. Um, and uh, yeah, apart from that, I'm just on my push. So I guess, oh yeah, and then I think about a couple of months after I got my push, I put out a tutorial um, on YouTube, actually meant for a friend who had also bought a push, but didn't know how to use it. And I was like, oh, it's so easy. You know, let me just put together this tutorial and just explain it to you. And I decided, well, instead of, you know, uh, explaining it to her in like a private video I would just sort of explain it to the world and I uploaded it to YouTube um, and the video is called something like the uh, I think it's top five things every Ableton push beginner should know or something like that mm -hmm. and um, it's like a 30 minute tutorial where I cover all of the basics that you really need to understand to just get started with your push and that kind of I guess put me on the map you know in terms of uh, people finding me and my push related stuff mm -hmm. and um, ever since then you know because i you know received so much feedback i i you know i've been putting out courses and tutorials on youtube and um, i do a lot of behind the scenes stuff on instagram and uh yeah i guess that's that's the the quick rundown of what i've done so far yeah you've you've really dove in head first with that um and that push video, yeah, it's, I see it right here. It's uh, you know, one hundred eighty-four thousand views, which is incredible. Um, yeah, it's, of, it's, it blows my mind because I it, I did it in one take. I didn't even edit it uh, yeah. because, like I said, it, at the at that time, I didn't even have a single subscriber. You know, so I was like, no one's gonna watch this, but I'll I'll put it up anyway. And <laughs> that literally, I guess you could even say, it changed my life because yeah. because there was so much feedback. I was like, oh, let me maybe put a course together and. You know, now I have a couple of courses online and um, Melodics reached out to me. I put a couple of courses on Melodics and um, yeah, it's, it's, it's been crazy considering it's only been three years and I'm actually a drummer, but now people know me for push. Mm -hmm. It's weird. <laughs> yeah, right. That's it's crazy. weird how the in internet can change everything. Crazy really turns weird. our lives take, you know, yeah. like you can never predict. Yeah, it's definitely... Um, uh, a, a great source for anyone using push um push for life on youtube is um covering a lot of stuff and the melodic stuff was great um i think that's been since i've spoken to you um that that came out which is you know melodics i think is just a great system yeah for it's uh, if you're not familiar it's um it's i think of it as guitar hero for finger drumming but now it's also keyboards and real drumming and um yeah super cool system i think i always explain it the exact same way as a guitar hero for finger drumming but at the end of it you actually have a skill yes that you can use you know exactly. what i mean whereas you i guess you you could translate some of those skills to finger drumming that you learn on guitar hero but once you do something on melodics you know and you sort of figure out what you know the person who put together the tutorial how they put together the beats and stuff that's that's an actionable skill immediately mm -hmm. after you understand how to do it. I mean, right. You can load up different uh, sounds and away you go. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah, Guitar Hero is probably cool for getting some people into guitar, but you didn't learn guitar doing it. I, I, yeah, I played Guitar Hero, I think, once or twice ever. And I, I was playing against uh, he's a young kid. He was like young 13 year old kid and i was playing against it and he he'd been playing a long time and i i beat him at guitar hero like the first time i ever played it mostly because of the guitar skills you know oh, like really? I, I just had it a right, little bit yeah. of that practice the coordination that translates into guitar hero a little bit but i don't think guitar hero is so much in, but he was like i'm gonna practice yeah. i'm gonna beat you next time you're here and i was like dude why don't you just learn guitar that is, like do that instead with your time but with melodics you yeah. are learning the instrument so Absolutely. i think it's it's super cool tool and and they're really cool with education they've um i do this um music production club at my school and they've they kind of like gifted some of their 
course material over so the kids can fool oh, around with cool. it and learn a little. And some kids like to just do that. That's just what yeah. they, they don't even care about music production. They just want to play melodics. And yeah, but I, I think, um, you know, if you do it long enough and you get skilled enough, it will inspire you yes. to learn music production. Yeah. I it think it you know, sucks you in a little bit. Absolutely. Especially because I, I th that's one thing I really loved when I started using melodics before I put out the courses. Um, is I, I did I, I can't remember what levels they were, but there was a couple of levels on there that I really, really enjoyed just playing. And it was just so insightful to see how someone else would think about rhythm. You know what I mean? Like, uh, yeah. because, the, you know, that's the great thing about finger drumming, I think, is because you can put any sound anywhere, really. You know, you might be triggering a bass drum here, but you might be triggering a sample there. And just the way they all kind of interlock and the way the person who put it together, you know, thinks you can kind of <coughs> decode that from their lesson, if you know what I yeah. mean. So, you know, everyone has their own style of uh, um, putting together a finger drumming pattern even. You know, right. someone might play, you know, the entire bass drum and hi-hat with the one hand and trigger samples here. Or they might be playing between two hands and triggering samples with both hands. And, and, and they're completely different skills. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So that's that's something that I really enjoyed with melodics. Yeah, yeah. There's there's a lot of ways to play these uh, pad based instruments. You know. Yeah. And I, I'm I got caught up in in the whole push thing as a guitar player, because when you go into chromatic mode, which I'm well definitely gonna talk about in a minute here. <laughs> um, when you go into chromatic mode, it's laid out like the same intervals as a guitar, so a lot of the chord shapes are the same. On both I always thought it would, it would confuse you though, uh, because you know, like, what is it? The the fifth string is just isn't it one semitone down, or uh, up on yeah, the guitar? Yeah, the, the G string is where it would be. I guess it's a fourth, a fourth. Then it is. Uh, what does it go? The, um, I'm sorry, th not the G string. Um, from when you go from the G to the B string, it's a third. Right. Yeah, and then it's a fourth yeah. again. But, but it's a fourth relative to the that string right you know what i mean so the the that, there is a shift in the way the notes yeah when you get so to those I, is that is that not confusing though when you go to the push or do you just well, imagine it's just like the the first four strings exactly continue? yeah that's kind of how you think of it um right. like they just keep repeating yeah so um yeah maybe that's like a few minutes of adjustment but right but but it's it's not that hard uh, it's easier than piano for me. Right at, right out of the gate, it was easier than piano for me. Wow. First time I ever played it. So it's nice. And, and it does, yeah, I could see the uh, percussive draw too as a drummer. Yeah, because it's kind of like, I guess, um, you have the best of both worlds. Mm -hmm. So like even if I sit down to um, record, like like I, I used to really be into... Um, like uh, hang drums, mm -hmm. you know, like I have this sample pack from uh, Sonic Couture and I have a video online. I think it's called like a uh, able to push session or something like that um, where, I, where I do it. And you can see it's, it's th there's a mixture between finger drumming and, um, you know, like the way you play a piano, you know what I mean? So, so it's very rhythmic and yeah. this, the things that I come up with on a push, I would never come up with on a piano. Yeah. Because um, I'm used to finger drumming on the push. So just having the, the sounds of a piano on there combined with the way I would, you know, approach finger drumming, I, I come up with really fairly different patterns. Because I, I do play a bit of piano. But yeah. when I sit down on a piano, I'll always play differently than on the, on the push. Yeah. Which is cool because it kind of gives you these different approaches depending on what you... Uh, you what what way you want to compose or what type of parts you want to come up with mm -hmm. yeah i get the same thing even as like uh the most bare bones piano player out there <laughs> uh i i do different things on there and even though the push is uh, laid out like a guitar quite a bit i'm I'm not playing it like a guitar either right it's, yeah because you know it's, everything it's... and that's why i can justify all these instruments around me and why it makes sense that i need all this extra gear <laughs> because yeah everything is like a new access point to your ideas and your music that you wouldn't normally do yeah i've actually just bought um the expressive e touche oh cool cool 
Yeah, inspired by Houston Singletary. Yeah, he's I was the, just gonna know. bring him up because he's got his Instagram with. Oh. I mean, he it's amazing. Um, it, it's the stuff he's doing. It it sounds so expressive and um. It's ridiculous. I mean, yeah. I remember like when I just bought my push and discovering his uh, Instagram feed, and uh, you know that it was so next level. Like he was playing like guitar stuff on the push. And if you if you didn't watch the video, you would never know it yeah. wasn't a guitar. You know the way yeah. just the the way you play it, and, and and now with the touche, like he's been doing that. I don't know, maybe like six months now or something like that. Um, I was like, I need that thing, you know, yeah. because I I've always tried to stay self contained within the push, mm-hmm. but um, I think about maybe three or four months ago, I bought the Arturia. Uh, v collection with the, all the different synths nice because i i was really getting into modular stuff and i did some modular um reactor videos on my youtube and then i guess i i discovered oh oh i know why uh, because they brought out the uh the bukla um what's it called the the, the easel is it yeah the music easel that's it yeah. and i was like oh you know because I, I was such a bukla fan Mm-hmm. Uh, but within Reactor, you know, they, they have West Coast Elements modules. But I was like, oh, my God, you know, uh, I could get to play on a, a virtual bukla. And I actually asked Todd Barton, because he was on my podcast, who's like this real sort of bukla specialist. I was like, you know, is it as good as, you know, at least to kind of get into the bukla mindset? And he's like, yeah, just just go for it. So I ended up buying the entire collection because I was like, you know, I'm I'm either going to spend two hundred on the bukla or four hundred or whatever it is, and get like twelve synths. Yeah. And then yeah. I was like, once I got the synths, I started realizing how cool synths are because I I never really got into synths. Mm-hmm. You know, like I'd use presets, and I'd love the sounds, but once I got into modular, I started understanding you know oscillators and filters and um, you know, LFOs and all, all of these different things. And then once I started looking at actual synths, I was like, oh, these are just like, these are just like pre-wired mod, uh, you know, modulars at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. And people have put a lot of thought into the structure of a synth. And I was like, you know, let me get into that. And then I realized with the push, um, there was just something lacking in terms of expression playing with synths. And then I was like, after watching um, uh, Houston, what he was doing, I was like, that seems like the logical extension to the push, mm-hmm. you know, because it's so expressive and you could just do it all with one hand. So I, I've bought it and I played with it maybe once, but uh, because I, you know, just released that course, I didn't I didn't have time to actually uh, really get into it. But that's something I'm, I'm hoping to focus on very soon. Yeah, that's kind of your reward for finishing your work, right? <laughs> exactly. I was like, uh, yeah, I need I need a little toy now. <laughs> yeah, that that's a really cool device. I played one at I think it was like the Brooklyn Synth Fest. They had one out, and um, I kind of like played it for like thirty seconds. I was like, okay, I better stop. <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, this is I'm gonna super want one. Super cool, and I don't have the money to do this, and <laughs> I'm gonna pull out a credit card or something in a minute yeah so um and yeah what houston does with it is is incredible really really nice stuff so maybe we can talk about your course a little bit you mentioned you were really psyched about the in key (coughs) mode of push but your course now is all about chromatic mode having all those uh dangerous uh extra notes in there absolutely so i i mean i guess uh in key mode, I'd been using for at least two, two and a half of the three years of owning the push. And uh, I, I actually didn't even want to get into chromatic mode because I found it so liberating to be able to just say, okay, now, because I, I really enjoy minor keys for some reason. And I just found just exploring minor keys. I could, I literally did that for about two years, you know, all of the different permutations and, you know, things you could do with it. But you know, I guess after those couple of years and, you know, seeing people like Houston Singletary and another one of my favorites is Jonathan Stein, mm. who I'm sure you're familiar with. Yeah. Uh, he's just like a, you know, genius in you terms had, of you playing great, chromatic mode. You had a great conversation uh, with him on the podcast. Yeah, the podcast, exactly. Yeah. Uh, that was a, that was an honor to have him on and be able to speak to him. But anyway, you know, just just watching these people do what they do. I was like, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm missing out 
you know i'm not using chromatic mode um because even though you know in key mode gives you this sort of safe zone uh that's the sort of positive side if you're not you know prepared to use other um other tones but you know it's also very limiting in that aspect even mm -hmm. if you just want to sort of quickly step out of the key and go back in you can't do it in in key mode so um you know i think it was around last october i decided i wanted to get into chromatic mode and you know i, I watched tutorials online but the, the thing that i found was they would always explain really well how chromatic mode is set up and the sort of uh, idea behind it like for instance uh, jonathan stein did a really great one on uh, reverb.com i don't know if you've seen that but it's just like three minutes where he's explaining you know how it's laid out for him like a base mm -hmm. and um you know demonstrates all of these really great things but at the end of the day you know because i'm not that first in harmony and uh music theory it is really intimidating you know to to be like how do i start learning this you know yeah so um and actually at that point i didn't realize that um you know when you're in chromatic mode depending on what scale you select it still lights up so mm -hmm. just as in the in key mode if i selected you know c minor i could see which keys would yeah. be in in key mode uh in chromatic mode right. if that makes sense yeah you can so, see the notes that are in the scale exactly because the, the way i always uh, approach chromatic mode is i'd always put it into uh, c major uh, because i have a bit of a piano background just so i kind of knew where i was Mm -hmm. if you know what i mean but you know uh the creators of push did something really great by letting you select different scales even in chromatic mode right <coughs> excuse I me so anyway i so think yeah, that's how jonathan stein plays right um and maybe he got into this in your podcast uh, but i've seen him um well I, I think i spoke to him uh once actually at, at the same brooklyn synth thing i believe a couple of years back um but um I think what he does is he s keeps it in C all the time, C major. It's, yeah, and, I and think he, so. He just, you know, since he knows his his theory and his chops, he he'll play in B flat minor, but it's yeah. still lit but, up like C. But I I also think that has to do with because I, I think at heart he really is a bassist. You know what I yeah. mean? Like, and he um, so for him, I it, w it probably wouldn't even need any lights other than the uh, root note. You know what yeah. I mean? And he would still just know the shapes. Mm -hmm. So um. Yeah, I don't even think he, you know, the lights, you know, he could put it in any key, uh, any scale, and I'm sure it wouldn't bother him, you know, because mm -hmm. I, d I doubt he relies on the lighting. You know what I mean? Yeah. Just when you watch him, he, a lot of the time he doesn't even look at his push while he's playing, mm -hmm. you know. But so anyway, to, to get back to what I was saying, um, I, you know, I decided I wanted to learn chromatic mode, but didn't really find any tutorials that sort of just would guide you through a piece or something. And um, there's one piece uh, by Johann Sebastian Bach uh, you, from the Well-Tempered uh, Clavier called Prelude Number no. 1, which is a piece of music that I always tried to learn on piano because it always seemed so simple because it's like Prelude Number no. 1 in C major. I was like, yeah. I can, I understand C major. and uh, But I always just found it too difficult to play on piano. And I, I, I got into bass for a while and I tried to play it on the bass. Also, to, I'd never get past maybe the first you know, five arpeggios, I would just be like, oh, that's just too much. But then I was like, I'm going to try and learn it on chromatic mode. So what I actually did was I just typed in uh, prelude number one in C major MIDI into Google, found a MIDI file, um, you know, because it's, I guess it's, uh, you know, it's not under copyright anymore anyway, because it's such an old piece of music. Found a MIDI file, loaded it into Ableton, I guess time corrected it because the timing was off. And then it's just looped each uh, section, you know, like each arpeggio. And uh, I, I just literally followed how uh, the lights were lighting up on my push. And obviously, when you're in chromatic mode, as in, in key mode, you know, f for each note, you know, you can have one or multiple lights lighting up, so, which meant that you could have all different kinds of finger positions mm. to yeah, play each uh, chord or arpeggio. So I, I guess, you know, I, I tried to work out the best uh, finger positions for each of the parts of the track. And I, I mean, it took forever because I, I didn't do it by music notation. I just did it by following the lights on my push and then just 
you know, committing it to memory. So I just loop, you know, each arpeggio over and over, and then I'd loop the first and the second, and then, you know, the first four bar or first four arpeggios. And there's like 35 arpeggios in the whole track. So, you know, it was, it was all done by memory at first. Mm -hmm. And then what I ended up doing after that, when I could play the piece, I decided to make um, these uh, chord sheets just in my sketchbook to kind of remember which fingers were where. And um, in the whole process of doing all of this, I was like, because I, I started out just doing it for myself. I was just like, I want to learn chromatic mode. But I ended up putting so much work into it. And because I you know, put out courses and tutorials, I was like, I should just make this into a course because I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of people who would also like to be able to play a piece of music in chromatic mode, but wouldn't be up for putting in all of this work yeah. just to be able to get to know what they have to do. You know what I mean? So I was like, I'm, I'm putting in all the groundwork. So um, I decided to then, you know, put together a, a course. And uh, the way I kind of did was, first of all, I uh, recorded all of the tutorials for each of the parts of the, uh, of the piece of music. Uh, so that was 35 tutorials explaining how which finger positions and then how to trans uh uh what's the word transfer from from one chord to the next because it's it's easy enough to learn how to play one shape but when you have to transition from one shape to the next shape yeah it's like oh how do i do that that's actually a really important part of learning the piece of music so yeah that's that's all of how i kind of put the tutorials together and then one thing that i also did which i did in another course uh, my finger drumming course uh, which i uh, the idea i actually stole from uh, mad zach him uh, for those of you that don't know mad zach he's like this genius freak level finger drummer sound designer guy and uh, i bought one of his uh sound packs and the way he did it was um he had these sound packs and then he demonstrated what you could do with them but he recorded himself playing the pieces and embedded the video into the ableton file mm -hmm. which meant that you know as he was playing each of the parts because the video was warped, you could just slow down the track and his fingers would slow down and you could really see what he was doing, right. you know, as slow as you wanted it. Mm -hmm. So that idea really stuck out to me. So I ended up deciding to do that with this chromatic mode course. I built this huge Ableton template and uh, recorded each of the arpeggios and embedded it into the Ableton file. I actually had this one huge Ableton file uh, which ended up once just before I think it was like three days before publishing the course I decided to you know download the zip that I put up for people to download and it just kept crashing so I had to actually take it and then uh, just do four arpeggios at a time because uh, I, I spoke with Ableton as well and they said it's probably because there's just too many video files in the one right. Ableton project file so there's all of these you know I think there's nine Ableton project files with embedded video so you can slow it down and just really follow my fingers and the other cool thing is i i included the the midi uh track which means if you switch on the midi track you can actually watch the push lighting up as the piece of music is playing it's kind of complicated uh sounding when i say it but i think you know if, if you see it it's actually quite simple well they have like so, uh really like you know basic keyboards that you can get for beginners that where the keys light up to yeah. share so it's, it's kind it's, of a it's similar that concept. idea it's yeah, that you idea just do it push that's awesome and then the other thing that i did was i took my sketchbook where i wrote down all of my notes and then uh this is also something you can see on my instagram i i took a just a, a piece of uh, blank paper and i just put it on my push and i took a pencil and i just sort of went over my push you know rubbing it back and forth back and forth so you could see the outline of the keys. And then I made my own sort of template um, sheet, a chord sheet. Mm -hmm. And then I basically took all of the, the chord notation that I made and I put them on, into these sheets. And when you print them out, you can actually lay them on top of the push and see where your fingers have to go. Mm. Uh, so that's something I didn't use when I was learning it, but it would have sped up my process. So, yeah. yeah, so that's kind of what I ended up doing. I put it, I put a lot of work into it and, uh, yeah, I, I, I released it, I think about three weeks ago or a month ago. And, uh, yeah, I've had uh, a lot of really positive feedback. 
and I made a performance video as well uh, for people to actually see me just play the piece which is on my YouTube and uh, Ableton just uh, posted that on their site which was an honor as always when Ableton decides to right. share something that we creators make that's official a, endorsement yeah that's always yeah. a great feeling hmm. so yeah that's that's sort of uh the the oh yeah so the one final thing that i forgot to actually explain was when i um made this whole bunch of tutorials i i realized uh, you know at first it was about learning how to play this prelude because that's what i wanted to learn but ultimately it was about learning how to use chromatic mode so mm -hmm. i i built this sort of uh I guess you could say prelude of, of uh, tutorials where I go deep into what is chromatic mode and uh, how it's set up and, uh, you know, a whole bunch of sort of I um, ideas of how to practice the prelude in order to really understand chromatic mode. So I use the prelude, the piece of music, in order to help you learn what chromatic mode actually is and the different shapes that work in different ways on chromatic mode. So... Yeah, it's kind of like two courses in one, really. It's one, it's about how to use chromatic mode. And the second course, I guess you could say, is how to learn this particular piece of music. Right. So, yeah. It's a great choice for a piece of music um, because it starts out super simple, super basic. It's just the C major, I guess, like the triad, right? Yeah. And... and um just the pattern stays the same really right like yeah you go, it's throughout the pretty much the entire track apart from the last few bars but then the chords start getting interesting real fast like he start yeah. he starts moving out of the key and for me that is sort of like where magic happens musically because you know like you stay in your key you stay in your scales everything sounds nice but i'm always fascinated like when those notes that are not in the key start making sense and it's yeah. just so interesting because you can really go to any note, yet you have to do it the right way. You have to set it up. You got to sort of yeah. um, create like some sort of anticipation or resolve through it. And I, I just love that. I mean, it's um, endlessly fascin fascinating for me and endlessly mysterious. It's sort of like the magical part of melody and harmony where you can break these rules and if you're not paying attention you almost don't even notice that it's happening yeah that's actually the one thing learning this piece of music uh, because i the, the the way i wanted to learn it at first was first of all in in key mode but because i said <laughs> um prelude in c major so i was yeah. like well c major is major. part of in key mode so i actually started because you could do the first uh i think two or three arpeggios in in key mode and all of a sudden you know there was a black key and I was like, it kind of, I, I was like, that's weird because like, hey. it says it's in C major. <laughs> yeah. And um, the thing that I found so fascinating playing this piece of music, apart from a couple of chords that, that do sound a little odd, but they sound right in the context of the piece. Yeah. A lot, a lot of the first uh, chords and arpeggios that uh, are played at the beginning, you don't even realize he's moving out of C major or using uh, notes that aren't in C major. Which, like you said, it's 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 magical in a sense that it's just it's genius. Yeah, I mean, he was one of the big geniuses <laughs> of all time in music. So, yeah, it, it's it's like sneaky. It's magic. It's uh, it, it, I love how it can happen where you don't even notice. It. And some of the things, some of the chords in that piece too. If you were to just play them on their own, you'd be like, Yeah, oh, that doesn't sound good. Like it sound like the cat just jumped on the piano. But when you put it in the context, when it gets set up, when the notes lead and, you know, resolve from one to another. Um, yeah. It, it's, it's so actually cool. it's it, it's a it, it's almost like a course in harmony, I found, you know, just yeah. like um, understand. And I think this goes back to what we were saying about melodics uh, earlier, the way I was saying, you know, when, when you play a level in melodics, you kind of start to get into the brain of the person who put the level together. You know, learning this piece of music for me was like, you know, just getting a, a glimpse of the greatness of this composer. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Johann Sebastian Bach. Um, and just sort of being like, oh, my God, it, it just it opened up a whole new world to me in terms of what's even possible just with those 12 notes. Because, I mean, that's another thing, you know, chromatic mode 
you know, we would, you know, Western musicians would say, oh, that gives us access to all notes, but it's only 12 notes within an octave. I right. mean, that's just you know, a relatively random number of notes within that frequency spectrum. You know, there's almost like an infinite amount of notes that could be there, but it's only 12. Yeah. You know what I mean? So to think of what you can do with just 12 notes in chromatic mode is mind blowing. You know, even just learning to play this one piece of music, it, just, it goes, it sort of goes all over the place and guides you. It, it almost like takes you by the hand and says, let's go down this little road. Let's now, let me take you over here. And the, the thing that is so beautiful about it is because this particular arpeggio is always the same, you know, the da -da 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 it's so repetitive that that kind of helps you focus or, or not get distracted. You know what I mean? It kind of, it yeah. just, because the, the rhythm is so repetitive, you can sort of like be like, uh, okay, I can, I can, I can follow the, the, the harmonic content. If, if it was rhythmically complex as well, it would just be like the fugues, you know, like the, the later mm -hmm. pieces. Like I'd never even contemplate trying to learn that yeah. on piano or push or whatever, because that's just too, too intense. But this one piece of music in the well-tempered clavier is just, it, it's just, it's so beautiful and so simple at the same time. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm magical, definitely magical. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Bach was uh, pretty amazing. And that, that particular collection of works was one of the first times people were using um, like even tempered scales. Like you're talking about the 12 notes. Yeah. Um, before that it wasn't like that and this is like this new almost like a new technology where we're gonna space the notes out evenly instead of slightly less than even what it would yeah. have been and um yeah the fugues is another layer there's a great app um i don't know if you've seen it um called fugue machine on the ipad i think i've heard i think i've heard of it but i, I have no idea what it does you might want to check it out um because it it definitely takes this concept of the fugue which is really just like a repeating pattern of notes, a little bit like the arpeggiators, I guess, in the prelude, but it takes this repeating pattern of notes and it plays it at, you know, what Bach would do is play it slower, play it faster, play it inverted, play it on different instruments, different octaves. Fugue Machine, it allows you, you basically you're creating like a single MIDI clip on a piano roll. Right. And you got your playhead that just plays through it. But then you have three more playheads that you can play that will play through those notes but you can tell it to play it like twice as fast four times as fast oh, wow. half as fast at a different octave you can have it play backwards you can't play forwards then backwards Whoa. so you get like these four different playheads going and they're just kind of like weaving and interacting with each other at different times um, so you might do like a really low note playing through the pattern um, yeah. very slow so it sounds like a bass just holding it down then the chord switches but all those relative notes are still the same so you get like this different feeling because now instead of um the first note of the uh little clip i guess the little melodic figure now you're getting the second note with all the other notes playing around it's a really interesting app and it sounds intense it's very intense and it's it's very shocking how it almost always sounds good <laughs> yeah. You know, if you put in put in something that's relatively musical and melodic, um, no matter what you start throwing at it, like it's really amazing how, and it might just be because we're only expecting those notes and we're used to it, but we get all these different relationships and the timing Can you even, and the pitch. Um, do do you just like input a, like a chord or do you input? Can you input ryth rhythmic information as well? It's rhythmic. Yeah, it's it's basically wow. like the piano editor. Oh, okay. You know, it's that's pretty much what you get. If you imagine, like in live, you get your piano yeah. roll, and um, imagine you just had a clip, like a one bar loop. I think you can do a couple bars in Fugue Machine, but uh, you just tell the playheads to go through it at different times. So one one playhead might be playing a one bar loop. The can next you, can one you might even export it? Like, you know what I mean? Like, uh, because it sounds like if you had this really great idea, uh, you know I what I mean? It sounds and out it's just really yeah, so you yeah, it does because um, I've used it to um, like trigger synths and uh, other things. That's cool. So you you're not stuck with the basic sound inside the app, which they actually did pick a, a very tasteful road Fender Rhodes like sound. Yeah. But um, 
Yeah, I've had it. You can actually have each playhead send out on a different Whoa. channel. So yeah, so that's like a fun thing I've done with it is you just set up this one little thing and then you have four different synths playing. It's like having a, having a band play a few, yeah. I guess. Fuke machine. <laughs> Excellent. I will check that out. That's a beautiful that app. It's really one cool. of those apps where I say, oh, this is why the iPad's cool. This is why touch yeah, screen yeah, yeah. is cool. There's a lot of apps that are really cool, but they don't lend themselves nicely to the screen. Yeah. You know, they're like kind of mimicking real world things. Sometimes it just feels weird. Um, but this is one of those apps where you're like, ah, so you know, this, this is like some outside of the box thinking about how to use this new interface. And it works very well. One of my favorite apps. You know, it's, I'm going to check it out. It's, it's a surprising treat every time you turn it on and yeah. see what you get. Yeah, I think you'd like it a lot. And it, it definitely clarifies the concept of the fugue, too, because you, you just see what's happening really easily, rather than if you're trying to look at the sheet music, and, oh, which, I, which I don't read music like that. So yeah, um, I'm like my ability to read music is about the same as somebody with like a dictionary with them and they're going word for word. You know, I'm yeah, counting. Yeah, yeah. That's, Every that's good boy like does well. F fine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's like how I read music. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, worth checking out. Really cool app. So you've got uh, an exciting thing going with the new course out. It's been like about a month. Um, and uh, the melodics thing was also another exciting adventure for you. Um, do you have any plans yeah. in, in the future? Anything new coming up? Any new yeah, adventures um, I, that you can I talk guess, about? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I could definitely talk about it. Um, I, right now, um, because the the one thing that I always find really intense about the courses is they just really take a lot out of me. Yeah. Like um, my first, I've I've got three courses online now in my sort of push for life universe. And um, the first two, I think I probably worked somewhere between six and eight months to produce each of these courses. I mean, really working hard uh, to make them happen because, you know, obviously, as you know yourself, you know, we have to do everything. So it's, it's, you know, writing the material that, you know, or first of all, there's always that initial idea, oh, I could make a course about this. And that's the, the most exciting part, you know, like the whole 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration idea. And then really the work starts is, okay, so fleshing out ideas and then coming up with the structure and um, then, you know, deciding how to put together the course, the production of the course, which, you know, includes, you know, setting up the studio to record video, multiple angles, all different audio streams, and then putting all of those together in post-production, editing it, you know, sound engineering, and then, you know, uploading them to whatever platform that you make, mm -hmm. you know, coming up with all of the marketing for, it. you know, there's just so many elements to it. And each yeah. element, um, it's almost like you have to switch your brain. Yeah. So, you know what I mean? So it's, it's, that's the thing I think the taxing is like, if I'm like, as a drummer, if I have to just go play, I can drum for hours on end every day for the rest of my life. And that's really easy. Yeah. But if I have to sort of come up with a course idea, you know, that's one part of my brain. And then if I have to think about how I'm going to produce it, you know, where, which camera angles, how the lighting is going to be, that's a whole different skill set. Mm -hmm. And so you're just, context switching all the time and uh, i find that really really exhausting you know um as i think probably everyone who does this kind of thing any you know you know youtubers no matter how happy they might seem on screen i'm sure you know there's a lot of blood sweat and tears that goes into it that not a lot of people see unless they do it themselves so um yeah like i said even this last course that i did um i thought this was just going to be like a little sort of uh, easy course to th I, I and I actually made a first version where where I just took a camera and I just explained it and played it and then I watched it back and I was like I can't put this out you know this mm -hmm. is this is awful you know because I, I guess I have this certain standard that I want my stuff to have so then you know it ended up taking like four months or something like that to produce mm -hmm. it and um, yeah so towards the end of that I was like I, I just need a break from making these courses and tutorials and stuff. I'm, I I have all this stuff. I have, you know, like I mentioned, the Arturia V collection. 
I'm really into modular synthesis. I bought this Touche, uh, the Expressive E Touche thing. I, I mean, even just Ableton, if I was not even to touch anything else, yeah. <laughs> right. you know, I've got Max for Live that I've been wanting to get into for probably like four years, and I still haven't even opened it. You know what I mean? Apart from, you know, taking out stuff that's pre-made. But there's just so much that I want to learn again. And, and for the past three years, you know, doing this whole push for life thing, um, I've been concerned about uh, helping people, especially beginners, get into push. You know what I mean? So everything, I've always been looking at everything that I do through how can I make this accessible to someone who doesn't even know how music theory works. And that's what I've been doing for about three years now. Even with the melodics courses, you know, yeah. I, I, I always try to to cover the, the basics because I find that a lot of people online who do tutorials uh, without naming anyone, I find uh, it's more of an ego than online. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of the time it's, it's like they obviously want to do the tutorial, but at the same time they want to show how skilled they are. You know what I mean? So it's like this... It's this performance aspect, and I'm going to show you what I do. So a lot of the times, they they make really advanced tutorials where they expect people to understand all of the basics. And the thing is, uh, I found with my uh, like, I mean, if you see that that one video, it's got what I can't even remember. It was like 160 thousand views. That kind of goes to show that there's this huge amount of people who buy a push. You have no idea how to use it, yeah, you know, and and right. might not even know anything about music theory you know what i mean so that's always been my focus but the thing about that is because that's that's been my lens for three years um my own sort of uh process has become very much about seeing everything through this beginner lens whereas you know i've been a, a session drummer for 20 years and also been creating music producing and composing probably at least as long as well i started out on piano so I'm, I'm quite advanced on those levels, but it's kind of all fallen by the wayside. And now that I have all of this access to synths and all of this stuff that I, I really don't know that well, I really want to learn it. So um, what I've decided is I, I want to take a, a few months where I'm just, you know, I might still put out tutorials, but I'm not going to make myself put out any kind of tutorial. I'm just going to be like, if it happens, if I want to share something, I will. Mm -hmm. But I actually just want to create music again. I just want to... Um, you know, explore all of these possibilities we have because you know, you know, I'm I'm 43 now, so you know, when I started, you know, when I got into professional musicianship 25 years ago, you know, I'm sure you two can remember 25 years ago, the tools that we had back then, they were cool, but I mean, we're, this is like a utopian universe. Yeah. For anyone back then who knows what was accessible, you know, like even with the Arturia synths, you know, like having access to a Buchla music easel virtually that actually works as a, and sounds amazing, at least in my ears. You know, I'm sure there are a lot of people who are like, oh, my God, sacrilege. But, you know, to me, like, right. especially when you consider the price, you know, if I went out yeah. to buy a music easel, I'd be paying thousands in this way. It's costing me a couple of hundred bucks. But, you know, there's entire universes that I want to explore now in terms of sound design and music production. I'm really getting into mixing now. Like I, I bought, um, you know, a whole bunch of Isotope plugins recently, you know, Neutron 2, Ozone 8, and, uh, you know, a couple of other things I got in this bundle. And uh, mixing is something I've always been interested in, but it's, it's, that's a whole different level. So there's so many things that I, I just want to get into now. And um, the other thing that I found as well recently is I found that, uh, and I don't know what, what your thoughts are on this. It'd be interesting to hear your side of it. But like the whole social media thing, you know, Facebook, Instagram, uh, um, even though I, I, I love the idea behind it, I've, I'm kind of becoming disillusioned with it all. You know what I mean? Like... Um, because the algorithms, the way they work is unless you're outputting stuff almost like 24-7 these days. It used to be like once a week on YouTube. But now with Instagram and things being so short and everything is just, you know, little bite-sized clips, you know, mm -hmm. you're almost expected to put out stuff multiple times a day. 
You know, if you really want to be up there that the algorithm is sharing your stuff, you better be working like crazy. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I kind of tried that for a while. And uh, to be honest with you, I just I just don't like that kind of pressure. And um, it's kind of put me off everything for a bit. Actually, mm -hmm. I was at the point last year whilst I was making this course that I just put out, uh, maybe around December, I was actually just going to give everything up. I, and not in a bad way. I was like, what am I doing? I just want to make music. I have a studio in my house. And, and by studio, I mean an able to push. I've got Ableton. I've got a great computer and a whole bunch of software. Like, I'm a musician. All I really want to do is make music. And yeah. um, I'm at the age now where I don't feel like I even have to prove anything anymore. You know, like when I was 20 or 25, I was like, I want to become this producer and I want to produce albums and help artists become who they, you know, blah, 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 blah. But now I'm just like, you know, the type of music that I make for anyone who may have listened to my podcast, the music that's in that podcast is like music that I make, like the authentic music that just comes out of me. It's kind of out there and it's very experimental. And um, that's the type of music I want to make. And, you know, I'm I don't suffer any illusions that that's ever going to be commercially successful. You know, it could be, but, you know, most likely it won't be. So, yeah, like I said, a, a couple of months ago, I was just like, I just want to make that type of music. I have a family. I've got two kids. I've got a wife. I've got I live, you know, surrounded by nature. I have a studio in my house, you know. Like, I enjoy making tutorials. It's not like I don't enjoy it. But I was like, I just want to make music. You know what I mean? So that's kind of where this this sort of pause is coming from now. I found this middle way where I'm like, you know, I've, I've logged out of pretty much all social media at the moment. I was going to just delete it at a certain point. I was just like, I can't deal with this. I don't want to deal with this. And um, I almost feel held hostage by social media to produce content you know, just yeah. keep pumping or, or otherwise you're going to go down and no one's going to see what you do. And it's like, that's not what I got into this for. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah, right now my plan is to just uh, just explore all of this amazing software and hardware that I have and, and try to find my own voice again within this new set of tools that I have because I have all of these possibilities that I never had before. So I guess you could say the voice that I felt that I had found even just a few years ago will be heavily augmented by the tools that I now have because they can, they could do so much more. And also, you know, I, I, I want to um, invest in just learning all of these new skills that will just help me make that or, or refine the music that I've been making and finding that voice. Cause that's one of my big things um, that I also, I guess, talk about uh, in my podcast. You know, I really believe in, one of the most important things, especially for artists, but for all human beings, is is self-expression, is, is finding out what it is you have to say and share with this world, be it art, you know, be it politics, be it whatever it is that you feel compelled to say. And I'm a musician and I speak through music. And, um, you know, I think if you don't invest enough time learning the tools, you'll you know, and, and, and especially if you, you just use loops all the time and pre-made content and just rearrange it and remix it, you know, you could do great things with that. But I don't necessarily think you'll find your own voice as much as if you learn how to create your own synth patch or a modular patch. And then instead of using loops to make your own rhythms, maybe even make your own sound. I mean, I don't feel like you have to make every sound yourself. But I think the more that you do on your own, the more you will find what it is that kind of turns you on and speaks or resonates deeply within yourself. And, um, this, you know, there's just with all of the stuff, like I was saying, uh, you know, with trying to put out courses and trying to do a podcast, trying to be a father, teaching drums, and you know, just having this heavy, heavy schedule, you know, that that thing that I would call my authentic voice the volume on that has gone right down. I know it's still there and I can still feel it, but um, I, I want to turn the volume up on that and turn the volume down on, on all of this sort of social media stuff. This stuff that's really just a distraction, in my opinion, yeah. nowadays. I think the intentions were good when 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 people started out to you know with Instagram and all that kind of thing, but 
the kind of direction that it's gone in the past year or so is, is yeah, I, I just don't really dig it. What's your opinion on the whole social media thing? The whole social media thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, uh, I mean, a lot of what I do is built off of it, right? You know, yeah, um, a lot of here. what we both do is built off of it. So it's an incredible tool. It's powerful. It, you can reach people. It's, it's amazing that you can put something out there and people can see it. And, you know, just overnight, you can have all kinds of people looking at your work. I do agree with you, though, in a lot of ways that it can be consuming and it, it becomes the work. Whereas yeah, exactly. the actual work is no longer your work. And, yeah. and I, I struggle with this a lot. You know, take social media out of it a little bit, like kind of like what you're saying with like producing a tutorial co course. Um, you're doing the lighting, you're doing the sound, you're doing the videos, you're doing the planning. You're doing basically the job of eight different people or more, a whole crew that of different people, different <coughs> specialties, different jobs. That's a, that's a whole production crew that is all on you. So yeah. just there, your ability to produce your work is really you know I, i'm look your videos are beautiful you do a great job but i don't think you're thinking of yourself as this like video production guy not at all i i don't either and um probably people are like yeah no kidding idiot <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know unfortunately um it has become a big part of what i do and it's like i have to do these things so i can do the work i want to do yeah. um and social media is definitely one of those things. And like you said, you feel like you have to always be on top of it. And you start to feel like that's the job now. And and what about the yeah. actual making the music or, or creating the sounds or whatever it is that you want to do? Um, so I think that's a really difficult thing to balance and to deal with. And um, I, I struggle with that a lot. And there's a lot of like places that I, I do my work in and, a lot of different types. I'm doing this. I'm doing tutorials. I'm making my sound packs. I'm trying to teach. I'm yeah, I mean, the amount of output that you have is insane. I, I get, though, like a lot of like pressure for myself, too, that like I got to be on these things. I got to be on these things. And then I'm like, well, I want to make music, but I can't. I got to get this thing out. And that's like uh, uh, like I love everything that I do. I, I really do. But sometimes i feel like i'm uh, focusing on all the other things besides the actual work and the art yeah. and the expression and, and that stuff so i think it's really important to find a balance i'm struggling to do it but one thing i'm i've been doing is limiting myself to all the like you know i could be doing like product reviews i could be doing this or that writing i, I like to write but I, I could be doing it for you know, financial stuff, you know, to make some money. Um, and I have in the past, but that's not what I'm doing this for. And sometimes I have to remember and think about why did I start doing this in the first place? And yeah. it is really like, I love making music. I love exploring. I like tinkering with sounds. Um, I do love sharing it. So, and I love talking about it too. The, yeah. the podcast fits into this very nicely. Um, uh, making sound packs fits into it very nicely. Um, but some of the other stuff doesn't. So I'm trying to focus and just sort of make boundaries. Um, one, one area is, is like kind of like product reviews and sometimes it's fun cause they'll send you things. Um, but that becomes a pressure even like now I got this new thing. I got to figure it out. I got to make this video. I don't yeah. want to make videos really. It's like if I, I kind of wanted to ask you about your video production process in hopes that you'll give me some like fun shortcuts or easy things that you do that make your life easier. Um, you know, cause your content looks great all the time, but, um, that stuff really slows me down. I'd get a lot more done if I didn't have to do all that other stuff. Yeah, I mean, what that's another thing uh, that I, you know, I guess it's not something that I really talk about uh, because no one's ever asked. But 
the thing with um, the the video production stuff, um, like I'm actually really really shy. I'm a introvert, and um, you know, it's, there's a reason why I'm a drummer because I can hide behind my drum kit. You know what I mean? <laughs> Actually, the funny story is when I joined Cirque du Soleil, there, there was a drum solo where my, my drum kit sort of uh, drove out into the middle of the stage. And, and the only reason this drum solo was there was because they had to like uh, rearrange the stage and I was distracting people. Uh -huh. But, um, you, know, you know, there are creative directors and all these people involved in making sure it all looks really cool for Cirque du Soleil. And... Um, they were like, the symbols are in front of your face. We can't see you performing. So they ended up making me lower the symbols to almost just above the toms. Yeah. And it was like the it was a nightmare for me because, you know, now all of a sudden I was staring people right in the eye. <laughs> you know what I mean? Which, yeah. you know, I, I, I couldn't sort of hide because when I drum, I actually close my eyes a lot of the times. Mm -hmm. And it was, oh, I mean, I get like severe anxiety. So when I record my video content, a lot of time, like I'll put it off for ages because the the idea of getting in front of a microphone, and I I, I think it's also it's really hard. I don't know how you deal with this, but you know it's it's kind of make believe in a way because you're yeah you've got a you know you've got, like I have a GoPro or my iPhone facing me. There's no real human being in the yeah. room, and you have to kind of make it feel like. The person who you're talking or the person who's watching the video maybe months or years later feels like you're talking to them so you're like i'm always like making sure i'm staring right into the camera so i you know it you know in the tutorial or on the video it feels like i'm looking straight at you you know mm -hmm. what i mean so there's all of these things that make it really really awkward to sort of come across naturally i don't know if you have that but um I, that really stresses me out because it, it's it's the most unnatural environment that I feel like I could be put in front of. The only thing that would make it worse if there was an audience there <laughs> and I had to, you know, speak in front of them. But I get like, I guess it's kind of like almost like a stage fright thing. Mm -hmm. So I really have to gear myself up. OK, and now I, I'm taking, you know, next week from Wednesday to Friday, I'm going to record the content like that's a big a big thing for me, the actual production of the uh, the video material. Um, but apart from that, what I try to do is I I, I try to not I not script stuff as much as um, structure things so really really well. Mm -hmm. So when it comes time to recording stuff. What I try to do as much as I can is do everything in one. Like I might do like 10 videos in one take without stopping. Um, and I'll just sort of like clap my hands in between. So when I sync the audio up, I'll just see the spikes. Yeah. So I know, okay, that's something new starting. Um, so yeah, I try to batch things to be able to just, because once I sort of get going, then I'm fine. Just as right. like if I was on stage after the first five minutes, I'd be fine. But it's that initial, you know, you've got this light in your face. And once you kind of uh, get accustomed to that, I find then I'm, then I'm on the go and then everything's fine. But um, yeah, so once I'm, I'm on a go, then I want to get as much knocked out as possible. So I might even record, you know, like say for instance, with the course that I just put out, the... Um, the 35 tutorials I recorded in one go. Wow. Um, and then I just edited it. So I'll just take the entire, you know, I guess, you know, in total it might have been two hours of content. Um, and then I'll, you know, take it. And then I obviously I record my audio separately. So then the next step, once I've recorded all of the individual raw parts is uh, I'll import my audio into Ableton and... Um, you know, do whatever you need to do to make it sound good. You know, getting the levels right, uh, maybe EQing it, compressing it a little. And that's always just me experimenting. I don't have like a process. I'm just like, oh, this sounds good. And mm -hmm. by the time I do my next course, I've forgotten everything that I, that I did before. So I always start from scratch. I, I'm really bad like that. Uh, and then once I've got the audio, I export that and I um, import that into Final Cut. I use Final Cut. And uh, then, you know, I'll have this huge 
video file, you know, maybe like two hours long. And now all I have to do is sync up the audio and I'll use the audio from the computer with the audio from, uh, from the microphone. So I can just sync up the waveforms, you know, just get that synced up really nicely, turn down the audio on the video camera. And then I have, you know, pretty much the raw materials to just slice up. Like in that case, I'd just sit there and I'll slice up the, uh, the individual tutorials. So then I'll have 35, you know, basic cuts and then I'll go in through each video and then I'll edit, you know, if, you know, I stutter or I, you know, said something wrong and started again and I'll do that for each video. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty much how I'll work. So it's a, a lot of it's batching. I guess that's yeah. the, the best way I find instead of like recording a tutorial, you yeah, know, one tutorial finish. and then yeah. doing the audio and then editing that, that would drive me crazy. Yeah. Well, I think that it's almost like the assembly line process yeah. where once you're in the phase of doing one job, it's easier to stay in it. Absolutely. Where you can just keep going. Cause yeah, when you do stop, and then you go and do all the other parts. You almost have to start over every single time you change a role, yeah. a job. Yeah, this is, it, yeah, there's actually the word for it, is, which I said earlier, was uh, context switching. And yeah. uh, in the last podcast that I did with you, I, I told you about this book that I'd read um, about Scrum. I don't know if you remember. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, and that's where uh, the guy who wrote that uh, in that book, he talks a lot about context switching, mm -hmm. where, um, you know, if you have different tasks that you have to do. If you keep switching between them, the more times you have to switch exponentially longer, it's going to take you to actually do everything. Yeah. You know what I mean? So the less you have to context switch. So like in this case, you know, I'm in um, performance mode where I guess I'm, I'm doing the tutorial and trying to be all like, Hey, this is how we do this. And <laughs> so I stay within that context. And then right. once I do the, all of those tutorials, then the next context is I, I get all of the raw materials finished. And then the next context is, you know, editing it and so on. But if, if I was to do it, I'm going to record one tutorial, then I'm going to switch context. The amount of times I'd context switch would be, you know, 30 or 40 times the amount. And with the, every context switch, your brain has to sort of put together um, – almost like this uh, card house, you know, like a, a playing card house. Yeah. So it's like stacking everything back up. How was this and how was that? And that takes time for your brain to do. Mm -hmm. And so with every context which you do, you can lose so much time. Um, and I think that's also even if you do music production or something, you know, first of all, you might, you know, and this is, you know, just a, a rule of thumb, obviously. But, you know, first of all, might maybe it's, it's just about, you know, finding like a nice sound palette that you want to use. And then going into composition mode and then, yeah. um, you know, coming up with drum beat mode, then arrangement mode and then mixing mode instead of continuously just going, OK, let me use this sound. I'm going to build this and then use this, sound. which you can do as well if you have all the time in the world. But if you want to be efficient, you know, yeah. you, you, you don't want to switch up that much. Yeah. Play one job at a time. I think that's yeah. where a lot of the exhaustion comes too, because that's that's mental exhaustion trying yeah. to go and it's easy to do that with producing because you're already you do all the jobs in the one software usually which which can work as well it's not like that won't work no no you know every everyone has their own ways but um in in terms of efficiency yeah. it's it's a very inefficient way in terms of energy and i think the this this period in time that we live in you know like having attention and energy is one of the priorities you have to have because there's just so much coming at you at any given time. And, you know, people like us who are producing content, there's just so much that you have to do. So efficiency is the name of the game, really. Mm. I think as well, one of my biggest problems is that um, the way I work with anything, it be it drumming, music production, or creating courses, I, the, the only way I can work is Im immersion. Like I'm, if I'm making a course like the last one on chromatic mode, from the, the moment I decide to make that course until the moment I publish that course to the world, that's all my brain is doing is thinking about. Yeah. I, I, can't, I can't switch off, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it's the same if, um, you know, as I was a session musician, I'd get a call to go on tour with a band. And from that moment onwards, pretty much until I nail that set, 
that's all I'm doing is just listening to the music, yeah. practicing. And even when I'm not listening to the music, my brain is just consistently working on it. So if that's the way you work with Im immersion, then it is, it's just, yeah, mm -hmm. very, very exhausting. <laughs> I hear you. Exhausting times that we're living in. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, your hard work has paid off well because, you know, you're doing really cool stuff. The quality is top notch. And um, I think you did a really cool thing in just focusing on that one piece uh, with, the, with the latest course, with the Chromatic Mode course, and just focusing on one piece to just really get a sense of it you know like it's i guess like um a lot of like finger drumming push electronic instruments you know they're not so much like if you're learning the piano you often do yeah, just exactly. learn a song and perform a song and like you don't always see people like performing just a piece of music on these things so it's like a cool thing to be able to do to just like kind of play yeah. this piece and to or all those like interesting changes in the harmony and the little sneaky uh, departures from C yeah, major yeah. that still sound good is cool. Like uh, case yeah. study and how to actually use the, the one of the my other sort of secondary goals um, in in deciding to play a piece like this for myself first of all before making the course. Um, one thing that I have a lot because I I focus so much on my push these days. You know, for the past few years. Um, you know, again and again, like, you know, in person and online, I'll have people be like, you know, they're, they're constantly just going on about, oh, it's just a controller. It can't, you know, it's not an instrument. And, you know, um, I think there's still not a mainstream acceptance like like a piano or a guitar or a saxophone or a violin that the push is an, an instrument among other things. But it is definitely an instrument like chromatic mode if you watch someone like Jonathan Stein or Houston Singletary playing, if you don't see what they're doing and you just hear what they're, the music that's coming out, there's no way you would uh, discredit it, the push being an instrument, right? So um, the, the thing that I found so nice about this piece of music, as you mentioned before, when uh, Bach made this uh, well-tempered clavier uh, collection of music, it was to kind of demonstrate this equal temperament and to demonstrate the uh, possibilities that you have. And um, I, I thought it, it, it was kind of like a, a nice way to be like, well, if he used that to show what a piano can do and everyone's like a piano is an instrument, if I can play it, I mean, you know, I've had people, you know, like criticize, well, you know, the, if you really want to play it, you know, it, it needs more dynamics and blah, blah, blah. That's not what I was trying to do. It was almost just to demonstrate it can be done. You know, I'm not, I'm not like the best able to push performer in the world. But if, if someone really takes the time, they could do all of the dynamics and everything just as a piano. So that was one of my other goals was just to be like, this is definitely an instrument. Like if I could play a piece of Bach piano music, in chromatic mode, how can you say this is not an instrument? You know what I mean? It has all of the same yeah. notes as a piano, you know, and, um, you know, then you get people saying, yeah, but it's it's connected to computers, so it can't be an instrument, which is just bizarre to me because, uh, you know, like, so if I, if I take a MIDI keyboard and uh, play a VST plugin, am I not playing an instrument now if I'm a pianist? You know, it's, it's like... It's just weird. But anyway, so that was one of the other sort of secondary goals I had in choosing to play that particular piece of music. I was like, hopefully this will just bring a little bit more uh, appreciation to what the push is, you know what I mean, to the mainstream. Well, I think um, that sort of thinking that, oh, it's connected to computer, it's not an instrument, I think that's that thinking starting to be endangered and going to be extinct yeah. pretty soon. Um, you know, um, Berkeley online or Berkeley in Boston anyway, has the uh, electronic digital instruments program. I, I had a great conversation with uh, Claire Marie Lim, who is a big part of their program. And, and they're saying your laptop's an instrument. Yeah. You know, your, your finger drumming, your MPC, that's an instrument. And they're giving it, they're treating it as like a focus instrument, just as if you were playing bassoon or right. any other more traditionally accepted instrument. And if you go back far enough, 
then you don't have to go back that far. There are a lot of things that we consider instruments that people said, those aren't instruments, yeah. electric guitar. Yeah. And people were like, what is this? This isn't. And then it took some people to really expose its potential. Yeah, there's for, that classic story of uh, Bob Dylan when he yeah. first played an electric, electric guitar and he was almost booed off stage yeah. because he had been playing acoustic guitar up until then and people I, were like, boo. anymore, yeah. Yeah. Electronics and... It's almost yeah. hard to believe that nowadays, you know, like that, that, that people thought an electric guitar was like a sacrilege, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, I, well, I... I mean, I understand, I guess, like a purist way of thinking, but I also think you, you can't be closed minded to. Yeah, but even at an acoustic guitar at the end of the day was like a crazy invention at one point. Yeah. You know what I mean? Exactly so I mean, so yeah. even for purists, it's, uh, you know, that, that that's just just closed minded thinking, really. Yeah. So I think you're you're fighting the good fight on that on that realm there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I you, try my best, and that's probably why a big reason why Ableton shared it too. I mean, they're they're that's a big um, like terminology thing for them. They they want to present it as an instrument. Um, and yeah. If you look, they they present it that way, and uh, it because uh, you can, as you've shown, and many people have shown, there there are virtuosos on this thing, and there oh, are absolutely. Um, there's a lot of pretty cool expression going on that is new and and um, hasn't been done before. And it may be sometimes to think like it's not, maybe you might say it's not as expressive as a real piano. Yeah. Well, that might just depend on what samples you have or maybe it's not a piano. Like why do we need it to be a piano? Why can't it be whatever it is, some new sound, some new to, so I, I I think that's where the electric guitar got into a lot of trouble in the beginning too, as it didn't have that authentic guitar acoustic sound. But when people finally said no, but it's still got its own thing, it's cool in yeah. its own way. I, I think that the the one thing that I I will agree with people on uh, when you know they're saying it's not a real instrument is I think in a in a live situation, it can be really really boring to watch because. Um, Unless you've got like a camera right over the finger, so people. But the thing is, because like a piano, everyone knows how it works pretty much. You know, if you're at a at a gig and you see someone playing a piano, your brain understands what's kind of going on. Mm -hmm. And if you see a guitarist, so you can when they hit a, a string, you know the strings making the noise and all that kind of thing. But with the push, like I, I went to see a gig um, recently, like a few months ago, and. Um, it was just these three guys. One one guy was playing uh, a Moog synthesizer. Then there was a guitarist who was making all of these weird sounds. And a guy in the middle had a push. So I was like excited. I was like, oh, cool. I, I can't wait to see what he does. But it, uh, just in terms of performance, it was just the most boring gig I think I may have ever seen. Mm -hmm. But the music was really cool. But um, that's something I find because because you have so many options with the push, like, you know, I might play something in chromatic mode, record it and loop it, then hit another key and all of a sudden be sequencing drums where I'm just sort of pushing beats and saying, okay, I'm going to put some eighth note hi-hats here and I'm going to hit an open hi-hat there where people don't see what's going on and they don't understand. Even me as a push user, if I watch someone do something quickly on a push and I don't know their workflow, I don't know what they're doing in any given moment. You yeah. know what I mean? Because I, I don't know what screen they're in. So I think that's really confusing. And it's not the most exciting thing to watch someone do on stage, especially if they're on their own. Yeah. But I think uh, that's not the point. The point is that like, if you're in a studio and, and you're working and uh, using it as a tool to create music, it is definitely an instrument. Just maybe not the most exciting to watch on stage. I do think that's a challenge of that electronic music does have a little bit. Yeah. I mean, certain instruments are just more exciting sometimes to watch. I mean, watching someone play the drums, it's so physical. Yeah. Electric guitar, they're running around the stage, they're on their knees, they're falling around. Like yeah. behind the back, there's all these like fun things you can do with these instruments. Yeah. Um, whereas, uh, like you said, yeah, like 
there can be a big disconnect when you're watching someone play some kind of MIDI controller and you don't even know what's yeah. happening. You don't know what you're hearing. You don't know what they're doing. Um, I I could say, argue, though, if you watch, um, I know, you know, Da Vinci. Yeah. He's on both of our podcasts. I mean, watch him play his his finger drums and his synths. I mean, yeah. he's sweating. He's like, that's that's a fun performance. That's well, he he's exciting. also very very uniquely talented. I oh mean, yeah, um, he yeah he's I would almost say he's he's the except exception to the rule, in terms of uh, just the way his brain's wired. <laughs> you know uh -huh. what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think like he's a good point that there's potential. Um, Absolutely, but yeah, I, so, I do especially agree with you I think too. the next next generation, when when people like when a push is just like part of what you've always known yeah like you know what i mean like the way an electric guitar for us we've we've never known the world without an electric guitar whereas our parents generation most likely remember the world before real like Jimi hendrix style electric guitars or heavy metal or whatever you know yeah. what i mean right so well kids today um when uh I always like try to sell my music production club a little bit and show them a little bit in class. And a lot of them will be like, Oh, it's a launch pad, you know? So they're starting to, they've seen this thing now they've seen it on yeah. YouTube. They've seen little light shows happen when people are doing like maybe on like his, his videos. And yeah. So like, um, it might just take a little time, you know, if you really think about like oh, I'm those sure. kind of grid Absolutely. layouts, the light up led grid lit outs layouts. Yeah. I don't even think they're 10 years old yet. And the launch pad came out probably less than that. Mono, maybe the mono is up there, but uh, yeah, it's new. It's yeah. uh, it's That's a new concept. That's nothing in terms of music oh, yeah. instrument yeah. history. So who knows? Who knows? Remains to be seen. Yeah. Cool, man. Maybe that's a fun place to stop with the potential yeah. for the future. Absolutely, on uh, a positive note. Yeah, yeah. I think <laughs> I think we'll see cool things and. Uh, Sometimes it takes some interesting, you know, new uh, groundbreakers to open our eyes to what's possible. We'll see. Yeah. But cool talking to you, man. Um, yeah. Great. Always fun. Love the uh, way you look at things. And um, your work is great. Everyone should definitely go to pushforlife.eu where That's you right. can check out push the number four, push the number yeah. four, L-I-F-E. At uh, dot eu, and you can see this new getting to know and love chromatic mode course, which is and even just watch the performance. If you're if you've listened this far, it's nice to just watch you play it, um, and to just to see like a a pleasing musical performance just done on the push is kind of cool, <laughs> like a complete piece of music. Um, so I think that's a good place. People should definitely check it out. We'll put we'll put all these links in the show notes, of course. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, before I forget. Um, I put together like um, a download for you, uh, your audience. So um, it's basically just the first four tutorials um, of the the prelude. Um, so it sh I explain how to you know finger placement. There's also the first four chord sheets that you can lay on your push, and um, the first Ableton project file with the first four arpeggios with the embedded video that I spoke about. Yeah. So um, I, I'll send you a link that you can put in the show notes if you like. And um, that will take them to where people can download. You know, it's just like, a, I guess, a taster. Yeah. Uh, so people can sort of see what it's all about if they're yeah. interested. Well, that's cool because then you'll, you'll know what you're getting. And, yeah. And, um, you know, and then you can still get a little practice even if you don't go all in. That's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which is cool. Yeah, that's very nice of you. Thank you. We'll get oh, that out in the show pleasure. notes. You can just click on that. And, uh, yeah, check out Push for Life, get the YouTube videos, all good stuff. Lots lots of cool stuff, lots of nice ways of looking at it. And I like this forward thinking, like this is an instrument thing, because I, I think um, if we keep our minds open and embrace new technologies and new ways of doing things, we're going to find new kinds of music and new new sounds. Yeah. It'll just keep our, it's good for everybody, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. I, I also think like, uh, you know, I've been talking about sort of taking almost like a little hiatus, but um, I think if I, you know, do what I plan on doing on really exploring all of this new software that I have, that um, I'll come back strong yeah. with new ideas of, we'll um, 
you know, probably more intermediate and advanced things now because I feel like I've covered so much of the, the beginner stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and I think if I sort of explore new territories, I'll definitely want to make a couple of new tutorials just sharing. Because I like yourself, I do enjoy just sharing ideas and putting them out into the world and seeing what people say and mm. hopefully also just inspiring other people to build on those ideas and uh, take them to a whole different level you know what i mean nice well that's something exciting to look forward to then yeah cool well thanks so much man appreciate yeah, you being thank, on thanks here. for inviting me as well yeah good to have you and thank you everyone for joining us it's been a great talk and we appreciate you listening and we hope you have a good rest of your day Bye. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs>